the meeting for custom streaming service. Cool. All right. Let's see. Danielle, I'll wait for a, a thumbs up from you. I think we are we are live now. I think we're looking live. A few minutes, a few minutes early this evening. I think we should be good to go. All right. Oh, and we also wanna we wanna record here on our Zoom platform. All right. So we're a few minutes before six here, um, and I want to thank all of you out there who are who are joining us this evening. Um, this is our fourth annual Forest and Fire Learning Series, and as we get settled in here, uh, feel free to use the chat function to uh, let us know where you're joining us from this evening. Um, and since we have a few minutes before six, um, let us know if you have any general questions for our speakers or about the learning series itself. And in the meantime, um, I'll let you know that this evening's event is the third installment in a series of five. Um, oh, it won't kick on until it's six. Okay, so we're actually not live right now. We are live right now. We are live right now. Great, awesome. <laughs> awesome, we're, so we're still live, that's great to know. Uh, wonderful, so as I was saying, uh, this evening's event will be the third installment in a series of five occurring every Thursday uh, this month of uh, April from 6 to 7 p.m., uh, where we invite county planners and researchers, land managers, and other experts uh, to share their knowledge with us about the effects of fire uh, can have on our communities and on our forests, our water, and our air. Um, this event began four years ago in response to the exceptional drought that much of the southwestern U.S. was experiencing at the time in an effort to spark community engagement and dialogue about the state of our forests and, uh, and begin thinking through how we could address some of the challenges facing our natural resources and the safety of our communities. And we're happy to be here again this year, this evening, uh, and with these conversations, and we're really excited uh, to hear from this evening's speakers, Emily Homan and Lo Williams. My name is Emily Swindell, and I work with the forest team here at Mountain Studies Institute, alongside Dana Hayward, who is Partnership Coordinator, also with the forest team here at Mountain Studies Institute. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the third installment in a series of five taking place every Thursday evening in April. And tonight, we're going to be focusing on adaptations and strategies uh, developed uh, or the challenges faced in 2020 regarding prescribed fire and public use of national lands and projects that were happening on our national forests. So as I work on sharing my screen here, I'll go ahead and pull this right up. All right. Cool. So um, I want to say at any time, please feel free uh, during either presentation to go ahead and type any comments or questions you have into the chat. Uh, and we'll open it up to all of those questions after both of our speakers are done with their presentations. So uh, before we get to that, however, we want to give a very big shout out to all of our sponsors, uh, without whom this event would not be possible. Uh, so thank you uh, to all of these partnerships, these local businesses, these other local nonprofits and organizations um, for all of your support. We really appreciate you. And especially those organizations and businesses that have provided in-kind donations for our free giveaway. Uh, that includes our partners at San Juan Mountains Association, Maria's Bookshop, whoops, there we go. Uh, also Durango Outdoor Exchange at, and uh, Pagosa Mountain Sports and Mountain Studies Institute. And if you would like to be eligible to win a combination of one of these totally awesome prizes, you must be 18 years of age or older. Um, like or follow MSI on Facebook or YouTube if you haven't already. And please fill out our very brief survey that will be located in the chat of YouTube or Facebook. And if you are a lucky winner, we will contact you 
directly and allow you one week to claim your prize. Um, and whether or not you would like to win one of these prizes, we'd love it if you filled out our survey because it really helps us gauge uh, how we're doing and um, kind of brainstorm uh, additional topics and offer um, topics uh, on wildfire that you are interested in for future forest and fire learning series events. So let's get on with it, shall we? Our first speaker is Emily Holman, the director of the Fire Learning Network and a member of the Nature Conservancy's North America Fire Team. The Fire Learning Network is a national network of landscape collaboratives that helps people work together to increase the capacity and social capital needed to build ecosystem and community resilience and live better with fire. Emily is a qualified burn boss with the National Wildfire Coordinating Group and holds a Master of Science in Natural Resources Management. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand off the screen sharing capabilities to you, Emily. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Let me pull that up here. I'm gonna get the chat window open here as well. Okay, so thanks Emily, and it's great to be here. I um, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone tonight. Um, so that was a great introduction and much appreciated. Let's see if I can get my computer to advance. There we go. So yeah, before I dive into more specifics about adaptations to 2020, um, I did just wanna pull up this map. Uh, about the Fire Learning Network so that you can see what that really means in practice. Um, so we're working all over the United States and uh, you know, from the East Coast and some very large regions over there over to the West Coast and multiple points in between. Uh, this is where I'm gonna be drawing the examples and the perspective that I'm gonna share this evening. Our members include state and federal agencies, counties and municipalities, uh, nonprofit organizations, private companies, and landowners. And, you know, what the text is here and was in that great introduction, what does that really mean? Uh, you know, in a nutshell, what it really means is that we work together toward better fire outcomes and living better with fire. Um, but it's a really fun group of people to work with. And even though you'll see that there isn't a green uh, shape on Southwest Colorado, we are working here. And I'll get into that more in the coming slides. So the Fire Learning Network is part of a family of fire networks. And uh, the FLN started about 20 years ago. And since that time, these other three networks have grown around very discrete bodies of work. So Prescribed Fire Training Exchange, or TREX, is uh, one of those networks that really focuses on getting prescribed fire on the ground, working collaboratively and learning and training together. And you'll hear me use that term TREX uh, several times um, at, at, through this whole presentation. The Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network focuses on exactly what it sounds like. It's really about communities uh, and, and people and neighborhoods. And a locally, our partner, and that is Wildfire Adaptive Partnership. And I know that we'll hear from them uh, later in this learning series. And then the Indigenous Peoples Learning Network similarly focuses on Indigenous practice and cultural fire and elevating the leadership and the voices uh, of Indigenous people in the United States. So you'll see this map is kind of messy. The take home is that we're working in a lot of different places. These networks overlap in a lot of those places and Southwest Colorado uh, is no exception to that. So we're working right here. Um, this is a set of pictures from the Prescribed Fire Training Exchange or again, TREX for short, that uh, we did with the San Juan National Forest in September of 2019. Uh, we brought in folks from six different states and 11 different agencies and organizations to learn and burn together right here uh, in Pagosa, in Bayfield, and over by Dolores. We also worked with Bureau of Land Management on some of those burns, especially over by Dolores. These folks came to get training and experience in how to do effective and safe prescribed fire. And they take that training back home to their landscapes and where they live. 
and apply that knowledge to their place. So these training exchanges are exactly that. They're exchanges of learning and information. Local folks can learn from people from other regions. Those people from other regions take the learning that they get here back home. So like I said, that was September of 2019. Um, and we were hoping to move forward with other um, tracks in 2020, but of course that didn't happen. So this is how we used to work. We used to travel and meet in person. We used to do workshops indoors uh, with no social distancing and no masks. We used to do field trips outside. We used to sit in rows and have classroom style learning. We also used to burn in the field with no masks and get together and do these trainings. You know, in the upper left corner is uh, two individuals learning about ignition techniques on a prescribed burn in northern New Mexico. Down below that is a training on ecological burning in Flagstaff, Arizona. This group in the other bottom corner is a bunch of landowners in northern California who are getting together to put good fire on their land uh, to reduce fuels and promote resilient ecosystems. And then the most fun picture I think of all in the upper right hand corner uh, this is a prescribed fire training exchange in Spain. Uh, some of our programs are starting to go international. For many years, we've welcomed Spanish firefighters into the United States to learn from our fire professionals and landowners here. And now we're going the other way. We're starting to work with those folks in Spain. And then COVID happens. Um, hey, it's interesting as I was putting together this presentation, I have all these pictures to show you of the work that we did and the way we did it before the pandemic. And then I realized it's really hard to show an absence of work. Um, and so the best I could do was actually show you my calendar, a screenshot of my calendar from last May, a year ago. That's very empty. And my May, I was supposed to be traveling the whole month. We had treks happening, we had workshops happening, and it was all canceled. Um, you know, when the pandemic hit, we really didn't know immediately how to adapt. And, and like many things, the easy thing to do was simply to cancel or postpone those events. And, you know, it, it was really tough to see that happen because we know that prescribed fire is one of our best tools for fire mitigation, uh, for reducing fuels and forests, for protecting our communities. But we had to consider firefighter health. You know, you saw those pictures of folks standing around together, talking, working together on the fire line really closely. And immediately, I think everybody in the fire community was asking ourselves, how do we do this work in a way that protects firefighter health? Um, how do we isolate ourselves? How do we social distance on the fire line? How do we put people in vehicles that are in really close contact, but keep them safe? Um, and do we have enough vehicles for that kind of thing? And uh, you know, a lot of questions were being asked about how to do that safely. And it took some time to put together guidance and to practice that guidance and to figure out what worked and what didn't. And a lot of agencies and organizations just stopped their prescribed fire last spring, just canceled the whole season, um, or were severely curtailed to doing smaller burns with fewer people that was more manageable for social distancing and, and the current guidance from the CDC at the time. There were some places that continued to move forward, you know, especially we saw in the Great Plains, where private landowners are uh, forming prescribed burn associations or other formal groups that allow them to pool their resources and do prescribed fire on their properties. Because those folks were all local, all from the same community, they were able to get quite a lot of fire on the ground last spring. Uh, they weren't relying on a lot of people traveling from outside, which would increase uh, the risk of virus transmission. We also saw the southeastern U.S. able to do quite a bit of prescribed fire over the spring and summer for the same reason. They have very deep and broad partnerships there where they could staff their burns appropriately and safely, 
with just local folks. And so that gave them some more flexibility than other parts of the country that often rely on fire practitioners to travel long distances. Um, so it was really hit and miss, but we saw a significant curtailing of prescribed fire due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And then unfortunately, as, as many of you probably know, some of the states, uh, particularly in the West, had a significant and historic wildfire season in 2020. So that's on top of a global pandemic. There was a lot of dry fuel, drought conditions, and some large wind events. This is a picture of the Slater Fire near Happy Camp, California. This is an area that's a, a fire learning network region. Uh, this photo is by my friend, Will Harling. And unfortunately, this fire had a really significant impact to the community of Happy Camp. Uh, there were a number of homes lost in this community. And this is a place where partners have been working for quite a long time to promote prescribed fire and do fuels reduction, but they hadn't gotten to a point where they could head off a, a fire of this magnitude in this particular place. And then again, as many of you know, Colorado also had a historic wildfire season. This is a picture um, of the Cameron Peak Fire, which when it was all said and done became the largest wildfire in modern Colorado history. And in fact, the three largest fires in modern Colorado history were this year, and that's the Cameron Peak, the East Troublesome, and the Pine Gulch fires. So if you think about a curtailed prescribed fire season, a global pandemic, and then a historic wildfire season on top of it, really significant impacts. You know, these large fires like this draw resources. They take a lot of resources to manage. And so other parts of the country where the weather is mild, conditions are right, often suddenly lack the resources to do prescribed fire. And that's even without the complication, that's in a normal year, without the complication of a pandemic. So all of these things together just made it uh, 2020 a really unique and difficult year for getting prescribed fire on the ground. So what did we do? What were the solutions? And the good news is that people really adapted. You know, one of the things that the fire community does so well is adapts quickly and shares those lessons widely. So starting last spring, there was an enormous amount of thought and effort that went into how to burn, how to do prescribed fire, how to do fire suppression safely, how to keep firefighters and communities safe. Uh, just wraps of new protocols and guidance and learning, you know, people saying, hey, we actually tried this guidance, uh, these techniques like social distancing and only two people per truck and spreading out during briefings. And here's what actually worked on the ground. And here's what didn't seem to work very well. And so the fire community really learned on the fly as they did the work. Uh, this picture is actually from uh, this winter, I know it's green, but this is in California, and these folks are learning together. This is a prescribed fire training exchange where they're doing some kind of classroom activities, and they are spread out on the lawn, and they're all wearing masks, So, and they're outside. So rather than just saying, well, we're just going to keep canceling our trainings, they're adapting and, and using COVID protocols to move forward. We saw a lot of locals only events and locals only burn crews getting fire on the ground. We saw self-supporting burn teams. So the idea of a module of one, your burn crew travels together and is completely self-sufficient and doesn't mix with other crews. We paid extra attention to smoke impacts to our firefighters in our community. Obviously smoke isn't good for human health, uh, especially long-term exposure to that. And we're fighting a respiratory illness in COVID-19. And, and so the early assumption was is that those things don't mix and we need to pay attention to that. And then we just moved to virtual trainings and meetings and adapted to that space, learned how to use Zoom, learned how to use Teams and all of those other tools that are out there uh, like this evening to be sharing with a wide audience um, and continuing to talk and to work together and collaborate. So I love these two pictures uh, because the one on the left is uh, a group of folks with the Ember Alliance and they were burning piles this winter after that significant snowfall that the Front Range had. This is up by Loveland and Fort Collins. 
This is near the Cameron Peak Fire. And so these folks are recognizing and those communities are recognizing that you just had the largest wildfire in Colorado history, but the work doesn't stop. So these piles are there from fuels reduction projects and they need to be burned. And so these crews are going out and doing that and working with their communities uh, to provide the community's information as to why they're doing this work. Photo on the right, uh, these folks are in Northern California. These are the people who uh, are members of the communities that were impacted by the fires in Happy Camp and Orleans. They know similarly that prescribed fire is one of their best tools to protect their communities. And so this is a training exchange that happened a month, month and a half after the Slater fire impacted Happy Camp. And these are all locals who got together to put good fire on the ground and implement prescribed fire with a great deal of support from their communities. And if you can imagine a community that suffered an impact like that, being willing to see more smoke and fire because they understand the importance of it to protecting their community long-term, it's just a testament to the hard work that all these folks have done in place uh, with their communities uh, to get to this point where they can show that level of resilience. And you'll see they're all masked up there. It is physically tough to be on the fire line wearing a mask like that, but it's what they needed to do to keep folks safe and get fire on the ground. So there they are. So, you know, taking this forward a little bit, um, what are the big lessons learned? And, you know, just stepping back, there's a ton of lessons learned about social distancing and mask wearing and other you know, cleaning protocols and things like that, the nuts and bolts that we can do to keep people safe. But the big picture lessons are also really important, primarily that the need for action doesn't go away because there are new challenges. Impossible challenges or challenges that seem really impossible, like putting good prescribed fire on the ground during a pandemic and after a historic wildfire season, there are also opportunities to have conversations with your community, uh, with your staff, with your firefighters to move this good work forward. Adversity creates adaptation and collaboration is more important now than ever, especially for folks who discovered the only way to move forward with prescribed fire was to utilize their local people and equipment when they were accustomed to bringing in folks from all over the nation. That importance of collaboration is just enormous. And if you know me, you know that I always say showing up is the most important thing you can do. And I think we saw that again demonstrated through all of 2020 and these challenges. The simple act of showing up for your partners, for your community, for your collaborative, it's so incredibly powerful. So challenges do remain. I don't want to make it sound like we've solved everything and it's all rosy. Significant challenges remain. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic is not over, although thankfully there, there looks like there's light at the end of that tunnel. We do still have to think about utilizing proper protocols to keep firefighters and communities safe. And pretty much everybody that I know of is continuing to use those protocols and those lessons learned. There are resource and funding limitations, especially in states and regions where budgets have been hard hit by the pandemic and the economic downturn. And then as you know, uh, and as we'll hear more about in this learning series, drought is a significant factor um, in the Western US this year, including in Southwest Colorado. And there's reason to believe that we could have another very active wildfire season in 2021. But there are reasons for optimism, uh, not least because there are really strong partnerships figuring it out together and problem solving together. There's a recognition of shared risk. We are all impacted by both the pandemic and fire, and we share responsibility for that and have to act together. And then there are a lot of new tools, new things that we learned this year, and the renewed sense of urgency and the commitment to the work. So I love this picture on the right in particular. It's folks in Northern California, another training event on a weekend in the snow, masked up, but they're there and dedicated to that work and just overcoming every challenge that's thrown their way. So bringing this 
right home to Southwest Colorado. I'm really excited to say that uh, we are working right now with the San Juan National Forest toward another prescribed fire training exchange event here in Southwest Colorado. Uh, sometime in the next few years, we're hoping to do something in 2021. Local conditions, both pandemic and drought and fuel conditions allowing. And uh, we're really excited about that partnership. Um, we're hoping to work with additional partners in Southwest Colorado to do good, safe, effective prescribed fire uh, for the benefit of communities, for fuels reduction, and for training purposes. So these are a couple more pictures from our event in 2019. And we're really looking forward to working with the San Juan uh, continuing into the future. So just a final slide on resources for more. Uh, our website is really long. So if you just do a search for the Fire Learning Network, one of the first results that comes up should be our website. And then if you're on social media, uh, on Facebook in particular, we do have a page for prescribed fire training exchanges and a lot of fun updates are, are there. So if you're interested in getting involved, we do take people on training exchanges who are interested in getting their first exposure and experience with prescribed fire. So keep an eye on those resources and we should have more information up as it comes together. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Emily. That was really great. And um, as I said earlier, we're gonna field questions after, um, after Lo's presentation. So if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, but for now, we're gonna go ahead and transition to our next speaker, Lo Williams. This is the partnership coordinator on the San Juan National Forest. Uh, Lo began her career with the Forest Service in 2001 and worked seasonally as a wildland firefighter, recreation technician, and fire prevention specialist before arriving in her current position. Outside the Forest Service, Lowe taught composition and communications classes at Chatham and Duquesne, I'm, I don't know, I'm pronouncing that wrong, Duquesne, Duquesne Universities in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and she holds a Master of Arts degree in writing. All right, thank you so much, Lo, and uh, I will let you take it from here. Hey, Emily, thank you. Sorry, my internet dumped me right. I just reconnected, so that was good timing, but let me uh, get resituated here and request control. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. I can't figure out how to request control. <laughs> you should be good to go. I think. Uh, oh, I can. Yeah. Okay. I okay. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, then I'm just going to switch to sharing my screen, guys. Sorry about that. So, yeah, um, I am with the San Juan National Forest. I'm the partnership coordinator, and I'm super excited to be here with all of you. And um, please, sorry, guys. Just bear with me. The multiple screens thing, it can be great, but it can also be quite a challenge. Boy, I really enjoyed hearing Emily's presentation. And I think you guys are going to hear a lot of similarities between our two presentations as we talk about some of the challenges and successes of 2020. Um, you know, it was uh, quite the year. And so I'll jump right in. Um, I believe you guys can see my screen here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so a little bit of humor to start. Uh, Preseason began with the announcement of a pandemic. And so as we jumped into our fire season, uh, we were negotiating the complexities of a really different landscape than we were used to working in. And so uh, there were uh, so many unknowns. And um, just to start things off, uh, the Forest Service ordered full suppression and, of all wildfires. And so essentially what some people like to call managed fire, 
or these fires that we allow to burn, natural fires that we allow to burn within a certain box, those were all put on pause and full suppression was ordered. Um, in addition to a blanket pause on prescribed burning, as Emily alluded to. And so um, that was done to keep fires small. It was done to reduce exposure to firefighters, um, to the unknown, essentially. And, um, you know, we didn't know if there were um, side effects with smoke and COVID-19, things like that. And so that blanket pause was put into place to protect everybody. Uh, we also entered fire restrictions. And uh, that was done region wide in the Rocky Mountain region, which the San Juan National Forest is in. We entered fire restrictions in March, which is really early and unusual. Um, and because we entered fire restrictions so early, we were the only agency in restrictions. Typically, our zone, what, what's called the Durango zone, um, which includes all of our fire partners, we're normally really coordinated in how we enter fire restrictions and uh, all of the agencies get together and they look at conditions and they decide uh, pretty uniformly to enter restrictions. But it was a little bit disjointed last year because really the US Forest Service was for the most part, the only agency in fire restrictions. And so um, that was another interesting challenge communicating to the public the difference between forest lands and other public lands and what those differences are. And those differences make um, a substantial, for example, um, if you light a campfire on the national forest, you know, where there's a boundary right there with another um, federal land that's allowing campfires, you could get a ticket on this side of the fence, not on that side of the fence. So there are consequences um, to those confusing situations. So, so it was challenging for those of us in communications to, to try and communicate that, but uh, we did the best we could and people were totally on board with us, which was wonderful. Um, and of course we all went to mandatory telework. I took this photo a couple days ago. This was um, my board, my sign out board at my office on the week of March 16th in 2020. I was in on Monday and I started teleworking on Tuesday and I haven't been back since. <laughs> and so um, just a little bit of humor there, but like a serious challenge for our fire management, especially fire and fuels management for all of us, but especially folks that were about to start training seasonals, onboarding seasonal employees and uh, expected to all and used to all be working together and training together. And so very quickly, and Emily mentioned this too, this concept of a module of one developed. And this is one of the squads on the San Juan interagency hotshot crew. Um, and this was maybe later in the preseason era where they had decided to become modules of one within each squad. So the two squads didn't intermingle. And that was one way that we um, figured out how to work together without increasing exposure. And so essentially um, firefighters quarantined before they came on uh, for the season. And once they were onboarded, they uh, socially distanced from other people and they basically only saw each other. And they got creative with training, PT, as we call it, physical training, um, socially distance. These are both pictures of the San Juan shots as well. and. Um, you know, staying far enough apart to be socially distanced, but still getting out and getting in their necessary training. And um, these national resources like the San Juan Interagency Hotshot Crew and Durango Hell Attack um, weren't allowed to travel. They had to stay on their home units uh, because travel and, you know, potential, there was just so many unknowns. And so the idea was, use what local resources you have, don't travel if it's not necessary. And so we weren't used to having our national crews, um, national resources on our home units, um, but it was wonderful. And they got creative and they were able to help with prescribed burn prep. And um, they got a lot of training done, like in this picture, it's the Hell Attack crew doing bucket training. And, um, you know, they figured out a way to do it as hot as it is to wear a flight helmet and you know, they're not training in their yellow Nomex, but I mean, I guarantee with those flight helmets and a mask on, that's pretty hot. 
So a little bit uncomfortable. But meanwhile, with the fuels program, right, they were on this blanket pause. And so they weren't allowed to do any prescribed fire. Well, last year, 2020, they had planned up to 25,000 acres to burn on the San Juan. And uh, with the windows available retrospectively, we're thinking we could have at least burned 10,000 at the very least. But with those paused operations, we actually were able to take advantage of other opportunities, which uh, included shifting our focus to uh, fire suppression and to continuing burn preparation for future years. And so um, prior to a prescribed fire, we have to prepare those containment lines that you know keep the fire within the box that we identify as you know the burn area. And so uh, fire th those fuels crews with some of the fire crews um, and crews like Trex prepped 10,000 acres. And so a lot of work was still accomplished. Um, we also used uh, contractors that had masticators and other local fuels and fire crews helped as well. And yes, Conservation Legacy, Bureau of Land Management, DFPC, a lot of partner agencies helped with that work. We also continued our cultural inventories and uh, also did mechanical thinning work. And so while our fuels program would appear to have been put on pause, they just did work that's going to pay dividends in future years. Uh, and then, you know, it was fire season <laughs> and that happens too. And, uh, you know, interestingly, the uh, San Juan didn't necessarily start with a big fire season, but we did have several um, kind of running and gunning fires on our partner agencies. So Bureau of Land Management, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs and counties like this 84 fire, some of you may remember that, um, got several fires early season you know, end of April, early May, and we supported them, the San Juan National Forest. This photo is of um, our air attack platform uh, helping out with that 84 fire. And uh, this is actually, this fire was later in the season, but I wanted to just demonstrate that mutual aid um, Durango Fire and Rescue, they're helping out on the Needles fire and the Moorfield fire in Mesa Verde. National Park. So all of those were, were not on the San Juan National Forest, but all of our resources and our shop crew and hill attack crew and um, aviation and engines all were there to support them and available to support them because uh, we weren't traveling outside of our unit. And Southwest Colorado was kind of the first to kick off and get going with the fire season, which is pretty typical in our region and will probably be true as well this year. So it looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulties uh, with Lo. She did let us know earlier today that um, her internet was uh, being a little bit challenging, but we're gonna, if you just hold on, hang in there with us, um, we'll, we'll get her back, um, back running up with us. All right, thanks again for hanging in with us. Uh, we'll get Lo back up on the line here. Um, I'll uh, take a moment to uh, remind you to please fill out the survey if you have a few minutes. And, um, and oh, it looks like we have Lo. Lo has returned, awesome. All right, great. <laughs> it happened. It how happens. This is gone? This, no, only a few seconds. It's all good. We're all good. I mean, this is live broadcasting, right? We're live streaming. This is real life happening right here. This so is how I'll, it goes. I'll go ahead and, and uh, go ahead and mute myself again and let you um, let you go ahead and take over, Lo. Emily, can you tell me where I was? Because I think I uh, I kept talking there for a minute. Uh, let's see. Go back one more slide. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, go back another one. <laughs> there we go. 
That was okay. the one we left off on. All right, cool. Good to go. All right. Thank you so much. Of course. I, I apologize, everybody. So funny. I've never had my internet drop during a Zoom call once, and now it's happened twice. So there you go. Adapting to change. Isn't that what I'm here talking about? Um, so yeah, not exactly sure where I left off you guys there, but um, we had a lot of support work to do with our partner agencies, BLM, BIA, and Mesa Verde National Park in the case of this particular photo. Um, and one of the big pushes of 2020 was for a lot of aviation support because uh, with aviation, we're able to keep fires smaller typically. And um, it also keeps those on the ground firefighters from intermingling a little bit more. That was the idea, at least. And so this is a picture at Durango Tanker Base. And um, in this photo, I'm, I don't know, I'm standing with a, an airplane. I'm excited to be putting retardant in an airplane. And so the, the Air Tanker Base does support fires all over the region in New Mexico. And so they did pump quite a bit of retardant, as you'll see in the slide there. Um, not a whole lot less than they did in 2018, which is pretty surprising. But um, again, there were a lot of smaller fires and there was this bigger push a little bit toward full suppression. And so um, we had all the crews that we needed too. You know, we had um, all the aviation we needed early season. The region as a whole was still under snow. So we got everything we wanted for those early fires and we crushed them. If if you recall, and by we, I mean all of the agencies, um, you know, working fire, and we just had so much availability of resources, and it was really quite successful with all that was considered um, playing into the early season. Um, now, operationally speaking, uh, just to sort of back up and talk about what the daily operations were like. Um, no masks were worn on the fire line, mostly because that module of one was pretty effective. Um, if we went to briefings, it was socially distanced, like in this photo from the ice fire. This is up in Silverton. Um, I think, no, this is our Chiletta station. This is Gilbert. It says right there on the slide. Um, <laughs> and so uh, you know, the point there is that um, if we had to meet in person, we were socially distanced, but we moved increasingly to virtual and um, a lot of virtual briefings, also virtual check-in at large fires. The fires I went to, everything was done via email. And that's really new and really unusual. I know that it sounds uh, pretty much commonplace, but for our agencies, the things are really done in person on those large fire incidents. We have our little yurt cities and we all show up and go to our check-in tents, and uh, that was all being done virtually for the most part. So um, it was a little bit different, and um, sometimes in good ways. You know, we learned that we can do those things virtually with quite a bit of success. Um, we, you know, started traveling at some point in the summer and realized, okay, we can safely travel following certain protocols. Um, this is just a picture of someone on the San Juan hotshot crew um, pumping gas, you know, <laughs> wearing a mask, pumping gas. That's, it became the norm that we're, we're all now pretty used to. Um, one of the major differences though, is um, without the big mess hall tents, so to speak, with um, the big fire camps and everybody eating together, uh, crews started cooking their own food more. And this is a picture of the San Juan shots again. Um, they cooked a lot of their own food and they said it was one of their healthiest summers they've had. And they didn't get the camp crud, that sort of, you know, the illness that floats through fire camp midsummer. Um, people stayed really uh, exceptionally healthy, which uh, was again, a pretty good outcome. But, you know, one of the side effects of all of this is that um, by the time fire season really hit, like hard big fire season, late summer, um, our crews were pretty darn burned out. They were exhausted. They had already had to uh, adapt and overcome uh, so many obstacles. And it was just the beginning. It was large fire support time, right? We're talking in our region, Cameron Peak in the East Troublesome. This is a picture of a helicopter I was managing on the East Troublesome fire. Um, outside of Steamboat Springs. And just one example of how stretched thin folks were, I was managing two helicopters on this particular assignment, which 
is only done if it's absolutely necessary. Typically would only manage one aircraft at a time. And so it just goes, it, it speaks to the fact that we were doing double duty in a lot of ways. Um, which is even more exhausting. And then we had big blowups. This is the day the East Troublesome fire um, really got after it and made its first big push. And, um, you know, crews at that point, seasonal firefighters were already returning to college, you know, being laid off for the season. And these big fires were still making big pushes. And here on the San Juan, we had the ice fire. Uh, 596 acres. This was just south of Silverton, for those of you who don't know. Um, and all of our available resources uh, that we typically rely on, for the most part, weren't available. They were on the East Troublesome. They were on the Cameron Peak. They were in California. They were all over the country. And so when the ice fire broke, which was a super late season, highly unusual fire, um, there weren't a lot of people available. And so we really relied on our partners, um, Montrose, the Grand Mesa and Compagre National Forest, other neighbors, other agencies sent what they could and we pieced it together. And it, and it turned out pretty well considering that. Um, but we were still in a national preparedness level five, which means essentially that we're drained on resources and there were very few available to us, unlike in early season. So, uh, Considering that, um, the ice fire turned out pretty successful. Uh, it did burn pretty darn hot though. And the thing about those late season fires too is that um, it, it, they continued to burn into what's typically our, our prescribed burn season. And even though that uh, blanket burn ban had been lifted, we couldn't burn because conditions were still doing this on wildfires. And then, uh, it was winter. <laughs> so I was on an assignment in these pictures that was outside my hotel room. I built a little snowman. Um, yeah, essentially fire season ended when winter began. Uh, so it was quite the whirlwind and people were exhausted at the end of the year. Now, I want to back up a little bit to that was sort of that chronological fire season piece. But during all of that, um, what about how we were operating with uh, public outreach and education with our partners? Um, I want to talk a little bit about what our collaborative groups were doing um, to help get the word out about both everything from fire restrictions to prescribed burning efforts that were ongoing um, with prep work, et cetera. And if, if you're not familiar with a collaborative group, collaboratives are a community-based group of stakeholders that are interested in the health of their local ecosystems, watersheds, forest health, uh, you name it. And um, we have uh, several collaborative groups in Southwest Colorado. And boy, did they step up because they were really nimble uh, they were able to utilize their available technology and continue engaging public. They kept the information flowing. They had public meeting platforms, right? Things that our big federal agencies aren't necessarily equipped to do nimbly. And uh, there was a lot going on through the whole season and it could be confusing and overwhelming. And they invited the public in and they kept them informed in a way that uh, I, I don't even think that we fully comprehend how wonderful that was in Southwest Colorado to have those resources available and both as community members and as partner agencies. And um, not everybody has that. Those, so those collaboratives and our um, nonprofits and other organizations were absolutely key to the success of all of our initiatives last year. And um, you know, those virtual meetings, some of them were better attended and had broader audiences because they were virtual than they ever would have if they were in person. And um, they kind of lacked a little bit more of the nuanced in-person aspect of them, but, um, and everyone complains about not being able to look at maps together, but <laughs> otherwise they were pretty darn successful. Um, they hosted field trips, as you can see, um, this one's out in Dolores. And, uh, and those were very successful. And all the while this was happening, right, we saw a lot of increased use on the San Juan National Forest and all of our public lands. 
Um, we were very fortunate to have uh, partner agencies like Colorado Parks and Wildlife and our local counties boosting capacity, law enforcement and patrols, because um, you know we had a lot of people in the woods. We had a lot of garbage, abandoned camps, abandoned campfires, um, people out there that didn't really know necessarily how to be stewards of public lands. And with humans come um, increased fire risk. And so having those collaboratives available to um, emphasize public messages about fire safety is so important because as we all know, the ma majority of our wildfires these days are human caused. And with more people in the woods, that is of increased concern and that is not going away in 2021. And um, the Forest Service does not have a great capacity for law enforcement or patrols. And so we were, with those fire restrictions that were implemented early season and ran throughout the fire season, we were given a lot of support dollars where we were able to bring in outside patrols to help boost our numbers. However, if we're not in fire restrictions, we don't necessarily have that extra funding to help us out. And so, you know, some challenges will be ahead of us as far as increased forest use and keeping um, the public appraised of fire danger and what it really means. And so, you know, oh yeah, the off-road driving, all kinds of fun challenges. Um, and for the 21, 2021 season, um, in the next couple of forest and fire learning series, I think, um, or the speakers will get a little bit more into that, but you guys probably are all aware that uh, if you're here and already interested in this type of subject, you know that the fire outlook shows above average large fire potential beginning in May um, and our capacity limitations continue. So um, it's gonna be a challenging season, but we have really strong partnerships in Southwest Colorado, um, ranging from our partner agencies to volunteers. And uh, there is an awareness and a willingness in our community for folks to get involved and step in. And that's really um, the greatest strength that we're so grateful to be able to rely on with um, our public lands and um, all of the increased use and the challenges ahead of us. So uh, I encourage people to get involved in your local collaboratives if you're not already. And if you're interested, you can reach out to um, either the folks putting this on at Mountain Studies Institute, you can reach out to me as well and I can help connect you. Again, I'm the partnership coordinator with the San Juan National Forest and I'd love to hook you up with the folks that are moving and shaking on this stuff and, and making it happen and uh, spread the word volunteer. It takes all of us. Thanks everybody. And I will um, put up that slide and mute myself and Emily, if you would like to take over at this point. Thanks everyone. Great, well, I'll just say thank you Lo so much for, um, for sharing your experience and those great photos. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and open it up to questions. So if you haven't already, go ahead and type uh, your query into the chat, um, and we're going to go ahead and relay that over to Lo and Emily, um, have them repeat the question so that everyone knows uh, what, uh, what query that they'll be answering. So um, let's see, we've got one, we've got one coming right up. And yeah, actually, Emily, I think um, I can take that first one. And then really, I want to hand it over to Emily, because I think that she can really um, speak to some detail here that I can't. Uh, the question is, what are the steps taken in planning and preparation work that goes into prescribed fire? Could either of you elaborate on burn plans, fire line prep, and vegetation treatments needed before we can tip the torch, so to speak? And I'll, I'll say that um, a lot of prep work goes into prescribed fire. Um, you know, I talked a little bit in my presentation about securing control lines and um, establishing basically uh, that barrier that the fire runs up, a, uh, up against. But Emily is truly the expert here in prescribed fire. So I'm going to let her talk more about all of that. 
Yeah, thanks, Lo. So sometimes there is a misperception that a prescribed fire is just igniting a wildfire and chasing it around, and it couldn't be further from the truth what we actually do. So a prescribed fire, or sometimes called a controlled burn, just a different term for it, takes a lot of pre-planning. Um, so folks go out to the site that they want to burn, they walk around it, they look at the landscape, they look at the fuels, which are the trees and the brush and the grass that we want to burn. They come back to an office, they draw on a map what they want to burn and where those control lines are going to be. Um, and there's like three different terms in fire for everything. So a burn break, a fire line, a control line, those are all the same thing. And just what it means is the, the place where we're going to stop the fire from burning or spreading. So that could be a trail, it could be a creek, a road. Uh, we make these with hand tools. We'll scrape the vegetation away down to mineral soil to, to remove that vegetation that's flammable so that the fire stops at a determined point. So, you know, all of that prep work uh, is both physical in the field, creating those control lines, uh, removing flammable vegetation from sensitive areas or thinning the trees and brush that are close to those control lines so that we reduce the intensity of the fire behavior. And then we also write a burn plan. And for some agencies, particularly the federal agencies, those burn plans end up in folders that are several inches thick. Uh, it's a lot of documentation. It talks about the weather parameters under which you can and can't ignite that prescribed burn, what your objectives are, describes the area, it describes the people and equipment that you need to have on site, it describes the people and equipment you need to have as backup or contingency resources available to you. It describes all the people that you have to notify and permits that you have to get if applicable. Uh, Colorado has uh, oversight at the state level on air quality. And so we all work with the air quality folks on smoke impacts to communities for prescribed fire. So there's just a ton of planning and prep work that goes into prescribed burning before we ever tip the torch. And I, I love that term, tip the torch. Um, so the next time you see a prescribed burn happening, just know that there was months and sometimes years of planning uh, from a lot of different professionals that went into that before that burn ever took place. It looks like um, we've got another question from Sylvia. What are the volunteer opportunities in Southwest Colorado? Um, well, I bet both of us can say a lot there. Um, so the San Juan National Forest has tons of partners uh, that are, you know, there are a lot of volunteer capacities. I'll start with that. And so um, there's no necessarily like volunteer firefighter if that's what you're thinking with, with the national forests. But if you're interested in anything from, um, you know, geez, building trails, clearing trails, um, being involved with information services with our various partners, um, you know, being at trailheads, educating people who are, you know, about to hike down that trail with no water, et cetera. Um, so there are lots of volunteer opportunities, everything from cleanup, to education, to trail building, um, all kinds. And uh, typically those are facilitated through our partners and nonprofits. And Emily, um, you probably can speak to more of that too. Yeah, so for prescribed fire with the Nature Conservancy, we can and do utilize volunteers, um, including on our prescribed fire training exchanges. Uh, the one big caveat to that is that you have to be able to meet the minimum federal standard uh, for participating on wildland fires. And so that requires taking a course that's about 35 to 40 hours that is online. Uh, it is available online for free these days, or you can find in-person classes if you prefer that. Then you have to take the PAC test, which at uh, the arduous level is nothing to sneeze at necessarily. It's uh, carrying a 45 pound pack for three miles in 45 minutes or less. 
Uh, so if you, if that sounds interesting to you though, that is available, we can help connect you to how to get that done. And then we can actually bring you out on a prescribed burn and let you get a, a taste for whether it's for you. And uh, a lot of people, you know, that first time they took the torch, they discover that they really like it. Uh, <laughs> So, but again, it's it's not insignificant, the training that you would need to complete, but we do utilize volunteers on prescribed burns. Yeah, so Lo, I can sure take the, the when to burn question. And um, this is from Anthony. How do we know when to burn? Um, that's a great question. So a lot of different factors go into it and, uh, where it shakes out, really, you have to think about the, the intersection of all of these factors. So one of the most important questions is, why do you want to burn? What is your objective in using fire? It might be simply to reduce fuels, to reduce hazardous fuels near a community or a home. Uh, it may be for ecological reasons. So we want to do some ecological restoration, improve wildlife habitat or improve habitat for plants. Um, or it might be both of those things, which gets pretty tricky, right? There's not always compatible objectives. And then we look at what time of year is going to be both safe and effective for us to achieve our objective for this firm. So, Midsummer is typically not a time in this area when we think about doing a prescribed burn because it's hotter, it's drier, um, or we have the monsoons and it's actually going to rain on us potentially. There's a lot of environmental factors that go into it. So here we think about the spring and we think about the fall. Uh, times of the year when the weather conditions are a little more moderate. Uh, higher relative humidity, lower average daily temperatures. Then we think about wind speeds. We don't want too much wind, but on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes you need a little wind to push the fire through a forest. Um, so you have to really think about the objective that'll drive the time of year that you want to burn. That'll drive what the weather prescription looks like, what those parameters are. And again, we're setting all of that well ahead of time. So on any given day, if your parameters aren't lining up for that day, then you don't burn. If your parameters line up to that predetermined condition, then you might make the choice to go ahead and do a burn on that day. Yeah, great description there, Emily. And this, it makes me think of the picture behind me. That is the Vicedo Piedra burn that took place this week, Monday and Tuesday on the Columbine Ranger District here in Southwest Colorado. And so that was a good burn window. Uh, they took advantage of it and got a thousand acres done. And Dolores, I believe uh, the ranger district on that side of the forest is planning a burn for tomorrow. So a smaller one, but you know, looking for those burn windows like Emily's talking about and the meteorologist and all of the experts are out there, you know, assessing everything right up till the minute they do their test fire. And um, you know, they, they proceed with caution for sure uh, because we all want it to go well. And um, the next question, I'll just like keep flowing here, especially since it's seven. Um, based on the, whoop, it just, let me scroll, just moved on me. Based on the 2020 experience, what's the possibility and probability of growing local resource bases and capacity so our communities can be more self-sufficient when it comes to managing wildfire and conducting prescribed fire? It's an interesting question. And I think that, um, for a lot of uh, the land management agencies, counties, um, fire districts, what's become very apparent is that, um, and not just based on the 2020 experience, just based on uh, capacity issues in general and the fact that wildfire doesn't necessarily recognize boundaries. Um, <laughs> it really doesn't recognize boundaries unless that boundary includes water or a fire line. Um, Uh-oh, did we lose Lo again? I think we, we lost Lo again. So until, oh, until we get her back up, um, I don't know, Emily, if you want to pick up um, 
where she left off, or if you'd like to move on. We have two other questions here. If you want to move on to one of these other questions, kind of up to you. Um, well, I think Lois focusing more on agencies there. So I'll just add, um, I'll let her come back and finish that thought, but I'll just add to that capacity question that private landowners are often the most um, resource limited of our partners when it comes to prescribed fire. And there are some efforts just beginning, particularly up on the front range, but we're also thinking about Southwest Colorado to help private landowners learn how to safely burn piles and then possibly down the road to do more broadcast fire on private land as well. So there are folks thinking about that. And I'll throw it back to you, Lo, to finish your thought on that. <laughs> Jeez, you guys, seriously, I don't know what's going on. I think it's the 30 mile an hour wind. Um, well, I don't even know where I dropped off, but I was going to um, throw out there that we do have a couple of big initiatives um, that involve funding for cross-boundary work which um, we really recognize as something so important to protecting our communities and increasing our capacity for prescribed burn and for wildfire support. And you know, when I say cross boundary, like I said, we really mean um, working with neighborhoods, uh, working with our counties, working with our fire districts, working with the federal government, uh, with uh, nonprofits, National Wild Turkey Federation, um, I mean, you name it. We have organizations and uh, volunteers coming together to make that cross boundary work happen and increase capacity because um, it, the funding isn't increasing for agencies and neither is capacity. And so um, we need to find new and nuanced ways of making that stuff happen. So hopefully I didn't say what Emily just said, um, you know, the fun of losing your Zoom call, but. <laughs> And let's see, should I just read that next one, Emily? Should I just keep going here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question, given the trend of extending, um, wait, did I just read the same one? <laughs> Don't read the same question twice. No, it's not the same question. Given the trend of extending fire seasons in the West and the reliance on seasonal work in wildland and prescribed fire, how do you see the agencies and burn teams adjusting their calendars to accommodate future conditions. Um, that's definitely been happening over the past several years for, and again, I can really only speak to the San Juan National or to the US Forest Service in the San Juan National Forest, but our fires, our fire and fuels programs have expanded substantially in the last three to five years to include more permanent staff that are not necessarily always 12 months, but they might be working 10 or 11 months of the year. And um, by increasing the number of our firefighters that are filling those permanent positions and decreasing the number of seasonals who strictly get laid off at the end of every season, we're increasing capacity and flexibility. And so if the fire season um, is starting earlier or ending later, those permanent seasonals can stay on or adjust their schedule according to the calendar. And so that capacity is being increased all the time and uh, it does allow us for greater flexibility and um, it's really showing in our programs. And also the retention is showing and um, retention is important because that keeps, you know, rather than a seasonal who's not necessarily obligated to one particular area um, and they bounce around the country, uh, which is wonderful too, um, they're in one location and they build some expertise and knowledge in that location and it provides stability for them as well. So those are all, all wonderful benefits of that bigger permanent workforce. Emily? Yeah, the only thing I'll add is that um, some of the, the folks that I work with across the country are also looking at how they can find funding to pick up seasonals from state and federal agencies who've been laid off and then retain those people in the same location just working for a different organization to move right into a prescribed fire season once uh, wildfire season has wound down. So I'm hearing the, the same things that Lo described and then people just getting creative with how to work together and retain capacity in these regions. And our last question of the night. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, this one's all you, Lo. 
<laughs> oh, it is. All right. Well, we'll see about that. I think it might actually be Brad Petreska who's talking and I think two Forest and Fire Learning series. I'm not the expert on this. Um, what things are taken into consideration when deciding whether or not to manage a natural fire start? Um, I can speak generally to that, but that is not my area of expertise. I'm not a fuel specialist or a fire program specialist. Um, but in general, the right conditions need to exist and the right boundaries need to exist. And so um, if lightning strikes on a ridge and you have really good natural barriers to allow that fire to expand and sort of hang itself up, as we say, with those natural barriers, or maybe there's a road on this side, um, a rocky outcropping on this side, a road on this side, and maybe we're able to build a little bit of fire line on that last you know, end of the box, then, um, the, and the conditions are appropriate, we can allow that fire to um, do the good things that it's doing at a low to moderate intensity. You know, that's not typically done if there's any anticipation of having large fire growth or extreme fire behavior or anything like that. And so um, those uh, naturally caused fires that are allowed to continue to burn up into those designated boundaries uh, can do really good work and decrease the need for, um, you know, the more uh, prep intensive prescribed burn operations and can also uh, reduce the risk of large fire growth in the future in that area. And so that's my sort of general summary of it. But again, um, I'm not that expert. Emily, you have anything to add to that? No, that is very much not an area of work that I deal with. So <laughs> I'll defer that question to you. And, and if Brad- We'll pitch it to Brad. Tune in in two weeks for Brad Petreska, our fuels program manager. Ask him yeah. that question again. You'll get a great answer. All right, Emily, I think that's all the questions that I have down. Awesome. All right. Very cool. Um, all right, folks, um, thank you so much to Anthony and Sylvia and Aaron for asking those great questions. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you to all of you for tuning in this evening. And don't forget to join us next week uh, for our fourth installment, uh, where we are going to be talking about the chemistry of wildfire smoke with Jessica Gilman. Uh, it's going to be a really great um, continuation of this conversation and a different aspect of wildfire um, in our area and uh, the effects of wildfire in our community. So uh, before you leave, uh, please do be sure to just take a few minutes to fill out our survey, especially if you would like a chance to win a combination of one of these awesome prizes that have been provided by Marie's Bookshop, Durango Outdoor Exchange, uh, Pagosa Mountain Sports, San Juan Mountains Association and Mountain Studies Institute. And again, thank you very much to all of our sponsors who have made this possible. Um, we so appreciate you. And uh, if I can get, uh, there we go, there are our slides. There are all of our sponsors. Thank you to all of you so much. Of course, we couldn't do this without you. Um, and again, uh, thank you to our speakers, uh, Emily and Lo. Uh, this evening and um, we look forward to seeing all of you again next week. Thanks again. Take care.